Joining me on the podcast today is partner with Hamilton Lock, Matt Baumgartel. COP26 illuminated the focus of governments, institutions and investors in transitioning to a net zero carbon world. At the heart of the world's plan is a belief that green hydrogen production and fuel can displace a global reliance on emission intensive fossil fuels. Australia, with its gift of plentiful sun, land and sea, combined with its economic capacity and trade connectivity, sees a chance to become a leader in driving its economy towards being a new export superpower of green hydrogen for Asia and beyond. But is this a realistic ambition? You're listening to Smarter Cities, discussions on urban life and how it's changing around us. Jason D'Souza. Matt Bongatel joins me now. Welcome to Smarter Cities. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for having me. It's great to see you. It's a, a miserable day outside, so a perfect day to, to be doing a podcast. And welcome in particular to Boardroom Media Studios, who've kindly hosted us here today, and to Will Canty, who runs this uh, amazing enterprise here. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, you know, I know you're going to make us look fantastic, so I really appreciate it. Absolutely. How have you been? All well? Very well. Very well. Very busy. The market uh, is pumping. Um, energy transition, as you've suggested, energy transition, COP26 has, has lit a fire under, under a lot of people um, and Australia has an enormous opportunity. But even prior to, to COP26 this year, and I'd actually say the last two years have been an enormous growth, there's been enormous growth and appetite for hydrogen investment and hydrogen projects in particular, green hydrogen. Well, I, I really want to use this opportunity to get to that actually because yeah. hydrogen has really become the new black. Hasn't it? You know, we went through a whole renewable phase and it was all about sun and solar and then mm. wind. And I remember early on in my career when we first met, we were talking about the lack of competitiveness of wind and arguing about whether it would ever be competitive, of course, with, uh, with fossil fuels. And of course, it, now it is. And yeah. there's been a whole market structure around that to get there. So there's, there's plenty to talk about in that space. But before I get to it, I, I always like to ask people about how they got into what they got into. So we unfortunately met when we were quite young at the yes. beginning of our careers. Yes. Uh, at that time, we thought we were both extremely serious. I think we've learnt that perhaps that might not actually be the case. <laughs> Absolutely. But that's all right. But you've always sort of been fascinated, really, with this space, haven't you? Yeah. What is it about it? So to me, and this is probably an interesting bent for you, is energy is, to me, a corner in a triangle of security and politics. So if you think about modern society, energy, security, and politics all feed each other. It's almost the, the triangle of of modern civilization, because without energy, we don't have anything. We've, we we organise ourselves in in a political system, and security sits off the back of that. Defence sits off the back of that. So to me, something that fundamental, like everything we do, is driven by energy, energy and energy policy and energy security. So how many wars have been fought about energy security? How many governments have rise and risen and fallen off the back of energy? Energy sits in the middle of everything we do, and as modern society progresses, from the beginning, you know, from, from, from the time man learned to create fire and harness fire, we were talking about energy. So it is a building block of civilization. But why, from a legal perspective, did you choose to get involved? So you, you're a lawyer, you've, uh, you're a partner in a, in a great firm, Hamilton Locke, which uh, you know, is quite invested in this space. You could have done you could have gone banking, you could have yeah. gone other ways. Why, why the law? And I won't make a lawyer joke, I promise. Right? <laughs> well, you know. Um, I think I just did. Uh, anyway. yeah, I think you did. <laughs> um, I think from, from my perspective, trained as a lawyer, as a, as a, in this space, it, again, it, it sits that, it's that political defence and an energy triangle that we talk about. In the, in the law, the law sits in the middle of that. Because the law is politics in some respects. The law is certainly defence. Well, politics creates laws and governs Co laws, does it? Co correct, but it floats around it. And I think that, you know, as a lawyer from the big, you know, as a lawyer, you are the reason people are lawyers is not because the law is interesting. Let's be really clear. The l people are lawyers because they like to solve problems, complex problems, really complex problems, in a set of frameworks, in a set of laws that you know you can help clients navigate. You also, you know, as a lawyer, you're there to solve people's problems, right? Fundamentally, a good lawyer has helping their clients at their heart. So to answer your question, why am I a lawyer and why do I do energy? I'm a lawyer because I enjoy the intellectual challenge. Why do I do energy? Because energy is really interesting. 
It's really interesting, and it changes every day. We were talking about hydrogen two years ago. It was a pipe dream. Mm. I mean, hydrogen's not new in any way, shape, or form. Decades, Two, right? Well, yeah. two hundred years, right? It's mm. the bu- it's the building block. You sitting there, and I sitting here, we are somewhere between sixty five percent hydrogen. We are hydrogen. It's the H two of I the, the H two O, right? Yeah. I mean, it is the building block. It is the most common element in the universe. It is the building block of everything. Hydrogen is not new. Using hydrogen, creating hydrogen, to to, to um, is an, is a, is relatively new, but it's not that new. Uh, Einstein talked about it. Mm. Newton talked about it. Right? There are plenty of people out there that have been talking about it for a long time. Creating hydrogen is not new. How we create hydrogen is a little bit new. Electrical electrolysis is a little bit new. Green but hydrogen. How do we scale hydrogen is what we're talking about now, really. Absolutely. Yeah. But that's the question. That's that's the right. reason why I studied economics, for example, right? And why I work in development. Like yeah. I work in, I like I like the intellectual challenge of doing big things, mm. big infrastructure projects, yep. big complicated new precincts in cities. It's why I do the my day job at Lendlease is exactly. about creating really interesting complex parts of mm. development that you know you wouldn't traditionally be able to do if mm. you didn't actually think deeply and work with multiple stakeholders and get involved and in the whole political debate about city shaping and energy is a big part of that right absolutely so this is why we get along because we like solving complex problems we just give a different sort of skill set to it mm. um, but ultimately we're just solving complex problems these are multiple not three-dimensional they're 10, 12 dimensional problems, right? And, and with multiple different stakeholders and, and, and different things, different ideas need to be navigated both in terms of now but acro- on a temporal nature as well across time. So this is the interesting thing, we bring it, you know, we bring it back to hydrogen, why now, okay? Um, why now for hydrogen is really not driven in my view, not driven by the econ- not, not driven by carbon, not driven by COP26. The, the, these are things that happen in the political space. It's not, you can't drive from a political, you've got to create a demand. You've got to, you've got to have a reason for it. And the reason why we need hydrogen and the reason why hydro- green hydrogen is very, very attractive is because we can create it at an infinite rate. All we need is water and electricity. Um, Electricity, the cost of electricity has come down substantially. Like renewable energy is now the cheapest form of energy globally. Mm. It is cheaper than coal. It is cheaper than gas. It is also infinite. The sun shines and the wind blows. The problem with both of those things is they're intermittent. The sun only shines in the daytime and the wind only blows when it's windy. That's the problem. So we talk about energy storage and we talk about how to create base load power or the concept of base load. You know, we need electricity 24-7. We also need a fuel or energy to put in particularly mobile applications, whether that is trains, buses, cars, ships. Long haul transportation, shipping, aviation. Aviation, exactly yep. right. So, and that you need a fuel. You need a source of energy that is easily transportable and on demand. So that that creates a huge opportunity. So that sector is very difficult to decarbonise. It's very mm. difficult to get away because we've developed internal combustion engines, whether that is petrol or, or diesel. Um, you know, people often ask me, am I going to drive a hydrogen car? I don't think we're going to drive hydrogen cars. I think we'll drive electric cars. Mm. But am I going to get a hydrogen bus to work and get on a hydrogen plane to fly around? Yes, I am. Um, Am I, are our goods going to be shipped internationally using hydrogen or a derivative of hydrogen, ammonia, which is just hydrogen plus? Yep. Um, so so y- the answer to that question is yes. And that fundamentally is a replacement of diesel. Correct. It's diesel replacement. So just to give that a little bit of a nuance, if you drive a diesel car because you're doing hundreds of thousands of kilometres a year, because that's when diesel becomes economic, um, then you might drive a fuel cell car, a hydrogen fuel cell car. But... If you're doing short hop, even even travelling between Melbourne and Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane, you can do that in an electric vehicle very easily because you know, the technology is there to char- recharge those those you know the, the the refueling or the range the range risk or the the range anxiety that people talk about in electric vehicles is not really there anymore. The, the fast charging is available to do it. So, to answer your question, why hydrogen now? I'd say to you, it's not hydrogen now. But what has created a w- the, the conditions, the market conditions, which mean that hydrogen is viable 
to decarbonise hard to carbonise industry, and we haven't even talked about steel and all sorts mm. of other stuff. Yep. Um, but hard to hard to decarbonise industries is because the cost of electricity, the cost of solar and wind has come down so substantially. Electro electrolysis gives us a way to fundamentally split water into oxygen and hydrogen. Um, water. Australia is blessed by, with having lots of water in terms of seawater. We are an island, and the desalination and the splitting of seawater is, is where we will end up um, in a hydrogen space. And we're also blessed with very good wind resources, whether they are onshore or offshore, offshore in particular. Um, and we are fundamentally a desert con continent. We have lots of space to put big solar farms. To put the stuff, yeah. Right? yeah. So that, that in itself creates a huge opportunity for Australia to lead the world uh, in, the create, in, the, in the export of green hydrogen and green ammonia. Our competitors are Saudi Arabia, our competitors are the Middle East, because they have, believe it or not, exactly the same. And they are looking at it, we're talking about OPEC countries, they are looking at it as their future. Look mm, at the as a replacement to their current oil dominance, right? Correct. That's right. And it becomes a fuel, right? And the, the yep. supply chain, that the supply chain for green hydrogen is very, very similar to the supply chain for LNG. Correct. And that's actually, you know, given Australia is one of the pioneers of the LNG sector. Correct. That's part of the reason why we're so well placed. But I want to take you back mm. a little bit because uh, you know, it was a, a great mm. segment just then. But um, to your point about it's beside politics that this, this transition is happening. And I'm going to take issue with that because I actually think that the the whole renewable energy sector has been driven by government subsidy up front. Absolutely. Right? And so politicians have had to make a decision to do that. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the, the, the trials and tribulations of the Australian scene, the, the 2007 carbon pollution reduction scheme, which failed ultimately uh, under John Howard, uh, Kevin Rudd's emission and trade, emissions and trading, I don't even know what it was called, ETS, yep. that failed. Uh, Prime Minister Gillard came in, she tried a carbon tax, that failed. Um, it wasn't called a carbon tax, it was called something else, but that's what people know. Can't as. say tax, yep. Um, what has been very successful is the renewable energy target, mm -hmm. right, which basically has forced investment into renewable energy and subsidised it in a sensible way because yep. the market actually had some clarity. Yep. Um, and I suspect now if you, you see the behaviour at COP26 of everybody signing up, the signals that... Um, global politicians are offering in terms of, yes, we accept now that we're going to have to reduce our emissions. Yes, we accept a net zero target. That's then led to sovereign wealth funds saying, our own administrations are saying a net zero target, so we're going to be investing in net zero, um, net zero things, mm. uh, to use a technical term, right? Um, and that has then led to you know, superannuation funds, semi-government, government also doing the same thing, driving this change. So I think I agree the market is taking a lead. You only need to see Mark Carney's uh, whole investment thing. I think he's got several trillion dollars now of money that is committed, it committed philosophically, I would mm. say, not committed, you know, in yeah, commercial yeah. sense, to that, that came, that was all another work stream of COP26. So I think what's really fascinating about this whole debate is we've seen how the emergence of new markets has happened through the renewable energy target uh, through subsidies uh, or regulation or whatever it might be in different mm -hmm. markets. Some have failed, like the, you know, I think the European Emissions Trading Scheme has not worked. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair to say. I think ours, you know, ours has been mm -hmm. a disaster. Um, whatever, whatever you might think it was the right idea or not, that hasn't worked. But I think the Renewable Energy Target Scheme has worked, and I suspect we're going to start to see some form of regulation move around that. And I think politicians have a huge role to play. So I think the the interesting thing here is you have one side of politics that's, you know, I'm in 2030, 2050, you know, Harvard, but they haven't necessarily defined how. Another side that is is really struggling with, with it, worried about, you know, transitions of industries and whatever, mm. and they've gone all in on hydrogen. And why have they done that? Because of your point that says, well, we've seen this story before in the LNG sector and we understand it. Yeah. So we can see that we actually, if we go all in on hydrogen, that solves this carbon emissions problem that the world clearly has, right? Um, and, you know, not to mention air pollution and whatever that goes with that, which are mm. sort of more immediate impacts. And for once, we actually look at our country and think, well, we've got a strategic advantage. And while Saudi Arabia and the Middle East is focusing on Europe to supply to, 
we've got Asia on our doorstep. Absolutely. And, and we've already seen a number of agreements with J Japan and South Korea and mm -hmm. at a governmental level to, to drive this. So I think your analysis is, is excellent, in particular on the market response. But I do think global politics has a role. A a absolutely agree. And probably, well, it, go governments have two choices. They have a choice of two things. Either have use a stick or a carrot. Okay? Sticks in taxes don't necessarily work. Um, and we've seen that with you know, renew, um, carbon taxes and other things around the world. To me, the renewable energy target was also a stick, but it was a, a very tailored stick. And it was focused on the 100 most you know, emitting energy producers, electricity producers, and, and the government said, okay, you guys have to either, you have to buy a certificate to retire because you have a carbon liability, right? Um, very, very, yeah, it worked. But we've got to remember that its original design was 50,000, no, effectively, uh, it was halved. The, the original mm, target was, was halved. Yeah. Okay. So it created, at the beginning, there was incentive and the government interfered. The government went and set up arena in the CEFC as the government's green bank and the government grant, grant authority. Um, and it funded a huge amount of money. Yeah, it pumped correct. projects into in projects that I delivered. Effectively, to, that's a subsidy though, right? It is a subsidy. Yeah. It's taxpayer money in there, mm. okay? And then you had, next to that, you had the renewable energy target, which created demand for renewable energy mm. because those large electricity producers, retailers, had to, uh, consumers of electricity, so the you know the Alcoas of the world and the Energy Australias and the Origins, they had to buy these certificates. They could either buy them on market, or they could buy them off market from a project, and they would go and sign a power purchase agreement to do that. Yeah, which is and where you got your explosion of wind energy and solar. Exactly, yeah. but that was the first wave. So those guys haven't signed PPAs for years. Mm. For years. All it did, that first trick, so the first government money that went in from the CEFC and from ARENA, um, plus the, the renewable energy target, which, is, which was built out. There was sufficient capacity built years ago, but it hasn't stopped the wave of renewables because that first government money pushed the price down. It, put, it built an industry and pushed the price down. So we're now delivering projects at much, much lower pricing and well below new build coal, new build nuclear, new build anything. It's the cheapest form of energy. So government subsidy, yes, it got it there, but in terms of a subsidy, we're talking about that subsidy came in about 2011. Mm. It was basically gone by 2015, uh, no, 2015, 16, was basically when it had been built out. So no one was buying more energy at that time from then on. So are you then, saying at that point that solar or wind or renewables produced at that point were cost competitive or price competitive at that point, at 2015? Uh, I would say that they were cost competitive at 2018. Okay, so let's take a step back. So let's do it in kilowatt mm. hours, right? Yep. So price of coal, uh, price of gas, price of um, solar, price of wind. Yep. Right? What are we? Cheaper? What are we kind of trading at? Well, you can go and get... So let's talk about what, let's talk about what the mar what the market says that, that that is worth. So the levelised cost of energy for for solar is is in the low thirties mm -hmm. in Queensland. Um, it's well excess of that for coal. Gas is in between. Um, gas is a little bit more expensive, but but coal is much more expensive. Um, so you're, if you're talking about it in terms of what does it cost to build new megawatts today? And that's probably what we need to focus on mm. because you have short run marginal cost and long run marginal cost. And I don't want this to be an economic debate, right? No, but it's but the key to the power sector, right? It, it is, it is. But you've got to overlay on top of that the fact that Australia's coal fired power stations are some of the oldest in the world. Mm. They're well past their design life, they're getting upwards of their useful life. Didn't they just demolish one of them, Willara Wang? Yep. Yeah, because it's no longer economically viable. These coal power, the coal fired power stations relied on them being built essentially on a coal mine, and that coal is running out. And if it's not running out, then it's getting more and more expensive, expensive to dig to it up. It. Yeah. So, whereas you've got, so that marginal cost of that coal fired power station, that every, every, every megawatt hour, is going up because the maintenance cost is going up. The reliability is going down because they're old machines. These are machines that were built before we were born. So design life is about 60 years. Something design like life is 30 years. Oh, 30 years, okay. And these right. things are pushing 40 years. Right, okay. I thought they were longer. Interesting. Um, 
The youngest coal-fired power stations are in Queensland, run by CS and Stanwell. Um, they are relatively young coal-fired power stations. Um, they will, they have it, they, they're still within their design life and will be for some time, 15 or 16 years. The, coal, the planned retirement of coal-fired coal power stations is, well, effectively there's, no coal, there's, no, there's none left when we start to get out to 2050. Mm, there's none they're left. Gone. They're yeah. gone, right? We're not building any new ones because you, it, it is cheaper to build wind and solar, but that doesn't get you across the intermittency. Right. And that is where it gets and interesting. that's the key for hydrogen, right? Is it the solution to our base load question? H hydrogen? So no. two years ago it was gas. Right. Yep. So Prime Minister came out, gas is our future. Right. Now we're all in on hydrogen. But this is, what the, this is what's really cool about hydrogen. Okay. Because once you've made hydrogen or ammonia and you've got it in a tank, you do lots with it. It's, lo it's a gas. Right? You can burn it in a turbine. Both GE and Siemens have turbines now, big gas-fired turbines, 650 megawatt turbines, that will burn 100% hydrogen. Without transition? So, so you, you can, can buy one now. So you can transition from gas in a gas turbine today and basically burn hydrogen. You can buy a turbine now that will burn gas and burn hydrogen yes, 100%. that's what I understand. Okay. Right? So that means that there's low transition cost then between a gas fuel I'm and a hydrogen. I'm working on projects that are going to they're going to get up on financing with LNG. Yeah, so it goes back to this marginal cost question, right? So, so that's yeah. a big deal. That's, that's a, a huge big deal. deal. So, so you're going from emissions intensive gas yep. to emissions free hydrogen. Hydrogen. Correct. That's what we're saying. But, but that's just the energy. That's just electricity, right? That's so you create the solar. So you create the solar energy. You turn it into hydrogen. You've now got a base load or a fuel source you can burn in a turbine. You can also put it in a bus. You can also put it on a boat and send it to Korea or Japan, or you can convert it into ammonia and also send it to Japan or Korea, or turn that ammonia into a fertilizer. So, just or on a, are we are you sending are you sending hydrogen in gaseous form, or are you sending uh, it in ammonia? The, the massive debate. This is the debate, right? There's a massive yeah. debate. Sorry, so, we're jumping around a bit. No, no, it's okay. good. No, no, this is good because this is exactly what I do every day. I was having this conversation with someone just earlier this week. Right, yeah, yeah, on Sunday actually. So anyway, um, in my view, so you've got a couple of different. You've got basically three ways to do this. You can convert. You can conv you can compress the the hydrogen. You can liquefy the hydrogen, or you can add nitrogen and turn it into ammonia. That's basically your answers. There's different pros and cons for both, right? Compression, obviously it's not liquefaction, so you've got a much bigger tank, right? But it doesn't cost as much of energy, you know, the, the parasitic energy to compress versus to liquefy. The challenge with liquefied hydrogen, and I am not saying this is not the answer, but you've got to keep it at essentially zero Kelvin, which is another 100 degrees cooler than LNG. Mm. The energy required to do that and to keep it at that temperature is enormous. We haven't, it's technological advance that will improve that, but it's very, very tech energy intensive to maintain cryogenic hydrogen. Right? It's also, it, not only to make it, but to keep it and then to regasify it, you'll also lose a lot of energy on the regasification. So compressed hydrogen actually is, is, could potentially be, particularly at a relatively short haul. So I'm working on projects which are make the hydrogen in Queensland, send it to Victoria. That's a mm. compressed type of... So that's a domestic supply. That's right? a domestic... Cap, and in the right? short term, that will be via truck, one imagines. Um, you, you would do it via truck, but again, if you can put it on a vessel, you're going to be uh, out, you're going to so create... So coastal this, shipping. Coastal right, shipping, okay. right? That, 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 and then you can talk about whether the hydrogen's in a pipe or not. We can talk about okay. gas networks and, and come back to that. But there's a lot of work going into that right now. And again, to convert existing gas pipelines to be capable of hydrogen Well, you supply. can put hydrogen in a gas pipeline. In fact, there was a test recently, right? 10% hydrogen through a gas pipeline. Correct. I think it was Gemino that did it, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they're doing it in Germany, they're doing it in Japan. Yeah. The Tokyo Olympics or a hydrogen Olympics. Yes. Right? Yeah. So there's, yeah. you can do it. So the challenge on the, and I'm definitely not the technical person, yeah, but the challenge, the, 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 the <laughs> challenge with natural gas pipelines is a lot of them are very old. Yeah. Natural gas molecule is the size of a beach ball. A hydrogen molecule is the size of a golf ball. So if your pipe is old and it has micro cracks in it, you'll leak hydrogen. Mm. Leaking hydrogen is not a good answer. 
right? Particularly if it's in a, well, leaking hydrogen in an open space is irrelevant, right? Because you'll never ignite it because there's not enough there's not enough of it condensed. But if it's going through an urban area, that would never be allowed, right? I mean, um, look, it's as dangerous as LNG. It's as mm. dangerous. I mean, it, it, it's no, it, 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 there's no real difference here, right? Um, but what's relevant for, for, the, for the purposes of, of hydrogen, I think, is that we can use our existing gas infrastructure, particularly the new infrastructure. But really what we're talking about is putting hydrogen into pipelines that exist, that are relatively young in the Surratt and the Bowen basins, for example, um, that now currently taking coal seam gas, natural gas, out of the ground and shipping it to Gladstone. There is no reason why you could not put a significant amount of hydrogen in that network and take the hydrogen out at the end, take the LNG or take the natural gas off, mm. the hydrogen off, compress the hydrogen or turn it into ammonia or do something else with it, take the LNG off, you can access that network that exists now. So that creates, and we we're talking about hydrogen and domestic supply and, and international supply export markets, that's where it gets really interesting for Australia because that market's enormous, both in terms of hydrogen being compressed or potentially liquefied. Where I think it lands, and this is where you started with the question, where I think it lands, I think it lands as ammonia. Mm. That's um, what I'm hearing too. That's why I'm asking the question. And is, uh, is it liquid? Well, it's just like liquefied, you know, gas, right? It's not like we don't ammonia. transfer. Yeah. Well, no, ammonia. So we transfer liquid, liquid yeah. gas in liquid form now. Why wouldn't we do it with hydrogen? Well, ammonia is even better because ammonia is basically liquid at room temperature. Mm, okay. So it's easier to transport. Right? Yeah. And in fact, I think we're transporting it now. I've heard, yeah. the, the, the global trade yeah. in ammonia is enormous. Mm. You need it to make fertilizers. You make, you make most of the world's fertilizers are made from ammonia. The world eats ammonia. Without ammonia, there'd be no fertilizers to grow the crops that we eat. That's the biggest market for ammonia right now. The fert so the, the explosives market is also very big. Right? So most of the ammonia that's being made. There's, a, there's an enormous ammonia trade, global trade in ammonia. Most of it's made from hydrocarbons, which are terribly CO2 emissive, right? It's a big problem. Um, but most of it's for fertilizers and explosives. It's a relatively small market when we compare it to coal. But let's do that comparison. So ex Australia exports a huge amount of coal to places like Japan. Let's just talk about Japan and South Korea. Both great countries. Both great countries. Um, both of them have relatively young, actually quite young, very efficient coal-fired power stations. And we sell them our very high quality coal to put in their very high quality coal-fired power stations. They are experimenting putting burning ammonia in those coal-fired power stations, mm. co-burning. So the global, you know, our export market of coal to Japan is enormous. Japanese are already talking about putting up to 20% ammonia in co-firing. So 20% of Australia's coal could be replaced with ammonia. That's 20 times the global trade in ammonia. Wow. By volume. Wow. It's enormous. The opportunity is enormous. And that's just existing built coal-fired power stations that can take it. Unfortunately, our coal-fired coal power stations are not good enough. They're not young enough. They're not, you know, high-intensity, low-emission coal-fired power stations. They don't burn at the rate. Um, that's required. Well, they, they can't take the heat. So ammonia is is very it burns very hot, right? And it is not an you know, it's not an unsafe substance, but it's not a safe substance. Well, I mean, it goes into explosives. It must be pretty good at something. Right? Correct. And the, the tragedy in Beirut <laughs> yeah. will tell you. Yes, exactly. Right, I was thinking that. that yeah. Right. That that you've got to be careful with this stuff. Yeah. But it's no more dangerous than petrol. It's no more dangerous well, than yeah. yeah. Right. So yeah. you think about it in that context. So. That's, the, that's a real opportunity for Australia. So you asked me what, what I think it was going to be, what I think it will be. I think it's ammonia. I think that the big players in hydrogen globally, Intercontinental Energy, CWP, just to name two large businesses that are operating in Australia, they will tell you that it's ammonia. Right? And because of the, the ease of it. Now, the ammonia piece requires more energy to make. So you make hydrogen. So you, you create energy, yeah. and wind you and solar. Convert it. You convert it to hydrogen, yeah. and now you've got to convert it to ammonia, which requires more energy. Or yeah. more, or you lose electricity. But as long as you're doing it with renewables, which are very cheap, which are cheap, if not, yeah. have a marginal cost of zero. Yeah, that's right. 
Okay, so that's and that's the game changer here, right? Is the price of renewables that again, you know, was kickstarted by a government subsidy scheme and exactly. CFC, you know, blah blah, right? Exactly. So um, then we go, well, what do we need? So we, government subsidies and taxations and dirty word, but government subsidy, government tax, government incentive policy, structure, regulation, carrots and sticks, everything be. else, they work. Yeah. And they work in relatively short period of time. We've got that in renewable energy, right? Mm -hmm. renewable, the, the renewable energy target tells you that it does. So what should government be doing now? Government should be doing exactly the same and they need to, on the hydrogen side. Mm -hmm. And you need to attack it from both angles. And I, um, the most of the hydrogen support that is being provided across states and states and territories in Australia. Let's leave the feds to the side for the moment. Most of it is actually focused on the supply side. Mm. Production. Uh, production. Production. Making right? it, right? Yeah. Because the problem has been, okay, hydrogen needs to be, to be cost competitive with fossil fuel or for, for hydrocarbons, needs to be, the holy grail is $2 a kilo. Yeah, okay? we've been hearing this $2 a kilo. $2 a kilo, yeah. right? So everyone's focused on, oh, how do we make hydrogen for $2 a kilo? I'll tell you how to make hydrogen for $2 a kilo. Create a demand for hydrogen. Yes. And, so, right? and one of the hydrogen producers said this to me recently. Right. The best way to get cost competitive in production is to create demand. It. Demand. Right. Yeah. So, and that's what New South Wales government's got right in its hydrogen strategy, because it's focused on both. So tell me about the demand side of this. So I get the special activation precincts. I get the hydrogen hubs. Uh, you know, the other states are also doing this, mm. Victoria. And, and, yeah. How are they doing it on the demand side? So ways to simulate demand. Well, any heavy haulage or large vehicle that is currently run on diesel can be run on ammonia or, or hydrogen. Let's just call it hydrogen to begin with, okay? Um, so the transition of, of bus fleets, garbage trucks, trains, um, anything like that that, in my view, should be focused on hydrogen. And they've, said, and they've said that. They're going to transition all that stuff to hydrogen? There's, that already, there's already plans to do so, right? right. They are, they are, but if you're asking me what they should do, that's what they should do. There are plans to do that. They're very much focused on the demand side to do that. Um, so I'm going to interrupt, sorry. Mm. So let's just have the debate now, because mm. I think it's a good point, between hydrogen fuel cell and battery. Mm. So we talked earlier about cars, right? Yep. I mean, it's interesting your perspective on cars. I agree. I think cars will be EVs, but depends on what energy they're being charged on. If they're being Correct. currently they're being charged on coal fire, you know, a lot of coal fired oh, power. Absolutely, that, that will become hydrogen or gas or gas in the interim, maybe hydrogen in the future, maybe. Yeah, I mean, you know? a world where, but yeah, a world where you park your car in your garage at home and you plug it in and you plug it in, yeah. and that now becomes a battery within your system, you've got rooftop solar, and Australia has the largest penetration of rooftop solar. Again, subsidised, again? Heavily subsidised, yeah. heavily subsidised with problems. Yeah. Creates a lot of problems in the market. And again, I don't want to make this a, an energy market debate, but rooftop solar creates a huge amount of problems in the market because it distorts. It doesn't yeah. follow market wholesale Not pricing. to mention that everyone starts abandoning the transmission network, but, but you know, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that issue, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's go back to the battery question. Yeah, so, yeah, so the battery versus hydrogen. So in my, so the best analogy I can think of, and I think um, I'm always, you know, analogies are really helpful in my mind to, to explain. A battery, whether it be grid scale or in a car, is like a Ferrari, okay? It's very fast to respond, but it doesn't have a big fuel tank, and it's not going to tow a trailer. It's not going to tow a caravan, right? Um, hydrogen in a hydrogen fuel cell is like diesel. It, 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 is, it has grunt. The energy intensity is enormous. Um, you can go long distance. Um, and if you've got sufficient volume of, you know, sufficient distance to cover, then it'll be a fuel cell. Vehicles that are running 24 seven or running 12 hours a day, delivery trucks, interstate trucking, trains, um, buses, garbage trucks, all of these things are doing long, long kilometres every day. Okay, the bat you don't need a battery to do that. You need grunt. You need, you need torque. So I remember I learned earlier today that you know there's a five times storage for hydrogen versus battery. It charges in five minutes versus forty five minutes for a battery. So a hydrogen fuel fuel cell, even though the technology is still evolving, 
already beats a battery, which is perhaps why Elon Musk is so angry with this whole emergence of, of hydrogen, where I think he was quoted as saying it's the most foolish idea ever, right? It's um, one of the most self-serving statements I've yes. seen. Well, it's entirely uh, a self-serving <laughs> statement, but that's okay. But I think uh, we're going to drive Teslas. Yeah, I think we are too, right? because they'll be charged by hydrogen. Well, that's kind of my view on this, and I could be wrong. I think right? they'll be they'll be grid charged, right? But so grid charged. But where's the energy coming from? Through wind the and grid? solar, wind and solar, and base load power. But they won't the, charge when it's not windy and it's not that sunny. That is true. They don't know. That's a good point. Right. Yeah. So you're talking. So you and I don't drive our cars every day. Or if we do, we're driving it for 20 minutes or an hour. Right. Right. Yeah. We're not professional drivers. Yeah. So our cars can go from our home to our office or to our home, our home to the shopping center, wherever we're going, we plug them in. The Internet of Things allows us to potentially go from, you know, use that, that store of energy as an arbitrage. We can buy and sell the energy that's stored in that vehicle depending on the market price. Mm -hmm. it, it, it becomes, this integrated network becomes very, very powerful in a battery context. I do not think we'll be driving hydrogen vehicles. I, I no, don't I agree. Think, I don't think we'll be driving hydrogen vehicles. But I do vehicles. think that our, our, you know, our Woolworths delivery will come yes. in a hydrogen truck. Our, we'll get a hydrogen bus to work. And we potentially will, will get on a hydrogen plane to go to Melbourne or Brisbane. So you're, you're saying, and I agree with this analysis, that long-haul transport, whether it's long-haul as in you know, 400 kilometres from A to B, will be hydrogen fuel cell driven mm -hmm. in some way. Yep. And long haul urban vehicles, whether they be your Woolworths delivery truck that seems to be arriving at our house constantly <laughs> as my children seem to be eating more and, and more. more and more. Right. I, I, I know that. Um, <laughs> like, you know, and, uh, and other delivery trucks like the Amazon delivery truck that also yep. seems to be a regular occurrence <laughs> as more and more cardboard boxes seem to arrive. Of what? Who <laughs> knows? Yeah, but that's okay. That's not to ask why. They will be exactly right. They will likely be also some form of hydrogen fuel cell, but your domestic vehicle will be likely a Tesla battery or some kind of battery, not to preference Tesla over the Nissan Leaf or whatever else, right? Correct. And then to overlay a little bit more on this is a debate I had with a bunch of the development graduates recently around, will car ownership even be a thing? Yeah, right? absolutely. And sort of, you know, from a funds perspective, you know, I'd love to own a fleet of vehicles that operate 24 seven mm -hmm. and that, you know, and that basically it's an institutional ownership of it and the cars are rented, mm -hmm. much like apartments are now rented through build to rent in many countries, right? Yep. Why wouldn't it be the same with cars? Absolutely. Why wouldn't you want full utilization of a vehicle 24 seven? Particularly if you're running cars? it as a, and that, that, that's a vehicle that you run on hydrogen, that's a fuel cell yeah, vehicle. Yeah, well, exactly. That's right, vehicle on demand, that's transport on demand, we, you know, and then yeah. you're talking about robotics, you're talking about, yeah, lots of different things, lots of right? Things. Automation of vehicles. And then it gets further than that, which is say, well, if in urban living, and this is a podcast about urban mm. life, do you need car parks anymore? If you don't mm. have significant car ownership, you live in the city in an apartment, yep. do you need car parks? What happens to a basement car park? The cost of, of infrastructure mm. to support a large residential building, the, the basement is significant. Absolutely. But perhaps you do need basement. What else happens with the basement? Is it storage? Do people need to store stuff? You know, there's a whole, probably another podcast. There's a, there's a waste in, piece in there in to talk this. about. Then there's a waste piece. Now, okay, so let's get to waste, right? Mm. But, sorry, let me going to take a step back. Before we get That's to waste, I want to get to, well, it, it <laughs> is, but waste is important. I want to get back to long haul transport, mm. right? So, Australia, land of distance, mm. land of desert, you yeah. know, we have, you know, Lots of stories about life on the road here, as mm. I've learned since coming here. It's sort of almost a rite of passage, really, to drive long distances. Yeah, even it's people, a, it's a car who, trip. even people who live in cities, sort of, you know, one of the big, you know, I read a survey about the biggest concerns about batteries was running out of distance, mm, uh, yeah. you know, about battery on distance. Well, not distance many people anxiety. are driving these days those yeah. sorts of distances. But point aside, yeah. Australia's emissions have gone substantially down over the time since we went on this journey, except. Transport. In the transport sector. Absolutely. In fact, if I'm correct, and you'll correct me, we're up some 20% or something on, yeah. lo on long haul transport. What because is the of future? Amazon, by because the way. of Amazon, <laughs> probably right. <laughs> Sorry, Amazon. We're, yeah, we're yeah. kidding. Yeah, no, um, no. What is the future of long haul transport? Are we moving from, how do we move from diesel fuel trucks and the infrastructure that goes with that mm -hmm. to something else? So. The answer, the answer, it's a leading question, and thank you for it. The answer is hydrogen, right? Yeah. The, the answer is that you can refuel a, a, a truck 
with diesel and with hydrogen at the same pace, right? It's the same refueling. Mm, it's just, that's the point I was making earlier. Yeah. It's, re- it's the same. That's the problem with batteries for long haul trucks. They yeah, take time. The technology. And they're heavy, te- right? Look, they're heavy, and and but technology is improving that. Yeah, right? No doubt. So yeah. so, but electric trucks will will exist, and Elon Musk and lots of others are pushing that very very hard. Um, if you ask me to pick a, how does it play? I think hydrogen becomes more effective, more efficient. You also, you know, what you've got to overlay in a, in a long haul transport context is that every driver of a truck has to break every so many hours for at least half exactly. an hour. Exactly. So that's not going to change, right? Until we get autonomous long haul trucks, and unless we're in the Transformers tomorrow, and I believe, I haven't seen the film, but I've seen this, the, the containers kind of you know, rushing down yep. the highway, yeah. we're a long way away from that. We are. Autonomous, uh, yes, yes. I, think, I think we're most likely, <laughs> inland rail is probably more going uh, to be the answer before it becomes... I, I would agree. So, right. so, so autonomous vehicles, again, if you make something autonomous, then you don't, you're, not, you're not paying for a person to sit there. So does it really matter whether that... Now, that truck's going to run 24-7. If it needs to charge up, spend two hours of that 24 charging, or even three or four or five hours of that charging, it's still on the road for 20 hours. Mm. So you don't... So that, that I don't think is going to be the impetus. What I think is going to be the impetus is that hydrogen gives you the grunt. Right? More so than a battery at current technology C- levels. At, correct, right? correct. It gives you the grunt. Yeah. Um, and they are interchangeable. I don't think they're... Com- they're the, the, the competition of this is... Uh, to me, the competi- it's, it's wrong to say they're in competition because it's going to be v- electric vehicles that you and I are going to drive and potentially we're driving around the seas. They may be you know, autonomous or not. Um, and there are going to be hydrogen fuel cell vehicles which are going to do the heavy lifting. They're going to the Mack truck of energy. Hydrogen and energy storage generally is a, is a Mack truck. So another analogy... Lithium, lithium batteries, the big ones that we've got on the grid, like at Hornsdale and others, right? They are fast response batteries. They can respond faster than, than most of the network can actually realise in hundreds of a second, okay? They are Ferraris, right? Their ability to provide frequency and voltage in the grid is that. But they don't, but they're very short, sharp, right? They're a race car. Um, compare that to something like pumped hydro or hydrogen being burnt in a, fu- in, in a, in a, in a turbine, um, or a Radox slow battery, they are big energy shifting batteries. They're big Mack trucks of energy. The same analogy can be made for transport. And, and transport is, as you said, one of the hardest to decarbonize because you need that energy intensity in the fuel. And you get that from hydrogen. At the moment, battery technology is a much larger, heavier way to create or to store that energy. Hydrogen fuel cells and technology for those f- for those fuel cells is improving literally every day. I act for a couple of different businesses with a couple of different technologies, and some of the efficiency gains that they're saying just by slightly tweaking things in a fuel cell is enormous. So there's a long way to go, and I was sort of thinking about this, and you know, in a in a context of to give it an aut- automotive feel. You know, we talk about Henry Ford, right, and Model T Ford, which is the first real, you know, production. Okay. We've argu- arguably, in electric vehicles, we haven't had our T, Henry T, you know, our T model yet. Right? We haven't had our first commercial scale. We've got Tesla, but it's really not out there running around the way that... No, it's the, still a luxury vehicle, right? It's right? still not accessible to everyone. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but that's coming. Mm. Right? It's custom, coming with Nissan, it's coming with Toyota, it's coming with, you know, volume there. But that's going to be electric. We are way back at steam engine type cars when we talk about hydrogen and hydrogen fuel cells. Mm. Right? We're way back at the beginning. So the trucks, I think, are very early stage. You know, Hyundai already has some that are in, in trial, I think, in Switzerland. There's a, another company, Hyzon, that's producing yep. heavy vehicles. Correct. There's a huge debate, I think, between you know, Volvo, Scania, and these other companies around whether battery trucks are the place. So yep. I almost feel... And in, you've forgotten our Australian homegrown H2X. Of course, sorry. Yes, and, and of course, love the Australian uh, brand too, which I know a little less about, actually, mm. but, um, but it's great mm. that we're doing it. I, I, where, I was, where I was going with this is I almost do feel um, that this is a bit of a battle between the famous VHS versus beta mm, debate absolutely. Back, back when, you know, the history of that, of course, you know, yeah. we, was well before us, but, um, mm. but 
that was a fascinating history. Mm. Arguably, beta was supposedly the better technology, yet VHS captured the market. And I just wonder whether we're in that space now. I don't think we're going to have... To me, there's not going to be a dominant. It's because the It's going to be a mix. It has to be a mix. Yeah. It has to be a mix. Because you and I are going to drive electric vehicles, electric cars, right? Consumer cars, okay? Our goods are going to be shipped in hydrogen vehicles, hydrogen long-haul transport, right? Planes, trains, buses, stuff, right? Trucks, all that sort of stuff. Um, it's going to be delivered in a hydrogen context, not a hydrogen fuel cell context. We're going to, at a grid scale, an electricity grid scale, we're going to have fast response lithium batteries to give us the, you know, the physics of electricity, the frequency and the voltage control that's required to make sure that power comes out of the power point properly, right? Um, equally, we're going to have other forms of energy storage, whether it be pumped hydro, whether it be flow batteries, um, particularly, and just to name a couple, that provide different solutions for energy storage. Um, to take energy when it's made, wind and solar, and remove its intermittency, make it available on demand. Okay, and there's a cost of doing that, which is the, eff the efficiency, how much, you know, if you put 100 electrons in, how many do you get out? Um, at scale, pumped hydro wins, hands down. Right? At scale, absolutely. Gravitational energy. Which is partially why the investment in Snowy Hydro 2 was made, I suspect. Absolutely. But if you think about, I mean, Snowy is two gigawatts. Snowy pumped hydro um, is two gigawatts. We probably need eight gigawatts of pumped hydro storage in mm. New South Wales to replace the coal. Which means we need to be building more of it, substantially more of it. Yeah. And there are lots of options to do that. Um, that is a that is a that is a clean that is a transition. If you're talking about what's the end point of a transition, the end point of a transition is lots of wind, lots of solar because it's cheap. Um, it's the cheapest form of energy, and then you've got to get rid of the intermittency. So you've got to store it. Storing it at a large scale is pumped hydro. Storing it at a smaller scale is flow batteries, and storing it to create or to to manage grid conditions what electricity people like me call FCAS, the FCAS market, frequency voltage control market, um, which we need because you, know, you need to control the, the way that the electricity flows around the network. You do that with a lithium battery. Um, so there's a mix. There's, this is not a VHS versus beta moment. But to give you a, to use another video analogy because you've reminded me of it, <laughs> there's a real debate going on right now as to where the service stations are having their blockbuster moment. Well, yes, right. Good. That's my point earlier about the what is the supply chain, what is the infrastructure that will transition to something. Correct. So you and I charge our cars in our garages or in the street, and they're doing the London. Do you, do you right? remember that company, Better Place? So about 10, 15 years ago, mm. they entered the market with a whole plan to basically start EV charging stations mm -hmm. all over the city. Of course, they were, well, they were way too early and died, mm. right? Yep. But the concept was, well, actually, we're going to start putting out EV charging stations, but and also it was based on the idea of actually changing the battery, yep. right? So, of course, that's not going to, to happen. But the concept was kind of right. What happens in this case? Um, so on the electric side, I think that if you're lucky enough to have a garage in Sydney, then you'll charge, you charge at home, right? charge at home. Yep. Um, and you may sign up with your electricity retailer to let them control the battery, charge and discharge it, right? And that's now we start talking about virtual power plants, mm. which is a whole new piece. And the whole regulatory environment around that is about to change. So that's that gets really interesting. In my view, you and I will drive those electric vehicles. We'll either plug it into our into our garage or we'll plug it into a lamp post like they do in yeah, London. Yeah, you plug it into a street. You know, Let, into a lamp post, anywhere, right? right? Yeah. Um, if, you, if you park on the street, that will be the answer. Overlay that with less and less car ownership because people, you know, if they will hire a car if they want to drive to Brisbane and otherwise they'll get an Uber yep. or whatever, whatever you know, it is. Like ride sharing yep. app, ride sharing thing. Hydrogen for, for heavy, heavy haulage or long transport, at the moment those trucks and trains don't refuel at the local petrol station. They refuel at their depot. They're not buying diesel from the local BP. No. That's right. right. They're, they're specialist it, facilities. That they're right. So you'll do the same with hydrogen. It'll just be a facility where you plug, you know, you fill it up. They're not, you know. So the service station becomes a lot more about service and a lot less about station. 
Well, it's already really. It's a already a convenience store. It's already a convenience store where you happen to get fuel. Right? Where you can buy petrol. Yeah. So those become convenience stores. So th- it's an interesting question as to whether service stations are having their blockbuster moment. Well, arguably, people might say that the supermarket is having its blockbuster moment. It is. The department store is having its blockbuster moment as we move to a distributed model where things get delivered to you on a far more uh, regular occurrence. In hydrogen trucks. In hydrogen trucks, right? So it's an interesting... It's when you put it that way, you sort of start to see that actually it's all related to the whole Absolutely. shift. And in fact, the pandemic, is, if anything, has accelerated the shift, right? Yeah. So there's definitely been a supercharge in the in supermarket um, mm. supermarket distribution, for example, Absolutely. changed completely as a consequence of the pandemic. Um, same it was with, changing. It was changing already, but it was forced. turbocharged. It was forced. Yeah, it can't go out, right? Correct. Yeah. Same with going. Same with online shopping for clothes and shoes and whatever. I Absolutely. Think there was a bit of a. There was probably a bit of a hurdle around people saying, "I still like to go and have a look at something." In the shopping experience. Yep. But, but you're going to have. I think you still will have some bricks and mortar retail. Yes. But it yeah. will be an exclusive experience. It will not be. I need a bit new pair of jeans. Yeah. So we had this debate where I had a retail expert come on the show, yeah. and Gary Horwitz, who's an amazing guy, and he. It's exactly what he said. He said retail is not about shopping; it's about experience. It's about having a great burger or being able to go somewhere with your friends, or you know. And in Asia, you know, I'm an Asian kid. I'm from Asia. Shopping centres are a place of entertainment. This, That's where you go. It's not yeah. the case in Australia. Like you don't go to a shopping centre necessarily for dinner, mm. right? In Asia, you do, mm. right? So it, there's a whole the another podcast again in, in this yeah. debate and this discussion. But I, I want to just take us back mm. to to hydrogen and the energy market because we've touched on a lot of really interesting parts and the the bit that I'm really interested in is what do we do now? So we touched on the New South Wales government hydrogen Mm. strategy, there's one in Victoria, there's one in Queensland, Uh, the Fortescue Future Industries, Andrew Forrest, one of our great entrepreneurs uh, with you know, FMG is now going all in. Uh, in the space, yep. Yep, he's gone big on you know, starting new electrolyzer manufacturing facilities, which That's is really interesting because he wants, to be, able to, make he it wants to be able to make it here and he wants to be able to generate as much of the stuff as possible. He's, he's going big. Absolutely. Trying to generate demand, great. So we go back to the beginning, right? We had the, the beginnings of the regulatory environment, the RET, you know, the, I thought you were did a lot say of the work. Big Bang, right? Because no, that's the, the beginning bang. of hydrogen. Well, yeah, we, we might <laughs> anyway, go that sorry. far back. <laughs> might go that far back. Um, what is the, what is today's regulatory market meant to do to turbocharge Australia to the top? So, if we are going to be mm. this export superpower, as our politicians are telling us we're going to be, and this perhaps is the green revolution that mm. everyone keeps talking about. And the markets are going all in, right, mm-hmm. to an extent. Mm-hmm. There's small pilot investments at the moment that are going in, increasingly larger, but the big bulk of the investment will be from the state, uh, the, from the public sector at the beginning. What does that look like? So I think the answer to that question is realising the potential. I think most state governments have realised that And potential. the federal government. And, has, the, fed, has, and, they've the, all, and the opposition, everyone. All everyone politicians, is on board, right? Green hydrogen, new black. The, what do the they do? The new black. So what do they do? So the, one of the first things that well, the global community needs to get certification right. So the big debate, and this is probably a little bit boring, but how do you know your hydrogen's green? Well, exactly right, because you know, we haven't gone into that, but there's uh, five different colours of hydrogen. There's a rainbow. And there's a rainbow of it, and really people only care about blue and green. The other ones are grey, purple, pink, orange, whatever, you know, clear. There are lots of different... But but just to be clear, everybody wants green, as in hydrogen produced with renewable energy. Correct. Not produced by carbon capture or storage or gas or whatever else. Exactly right. right. We're talking about green hydrogen. That's what, that's the, that's the utopia. It is, well, it's, it's, it's the reality because we can do it. Um, the way that you do it is you do it a couple of different ways. You you got to get the certification right. So if I'm in Japan and I'm buying hydrogen from Australia, I want to be able to say to my constituents that I'm buying green hydrogen. We haven't even talked about ESG, right? But the reason I'm buying that is because for lots of reasons, I need to meet the ESG goals or my consumers require me to do it. Um, that will be the impetus for them to buy green over blue or grey mm. or black or whatever we're going to call it, whatever colours we got. But how do I know? Right? You're now talking about, because in an Australian context or in a, in a national context, you certify it. Okay? So you have a certification. We have the Clean Energy Regulator in Australia, which regulates clean energy. 
right? It gives a certificate if you make clean energy. Yep. Just like we have certification of food or certification of uh, right. tablets or whatever it is, right? Right. So this is yep. where this, come, come back to where we started, this is where the politics meets energy. Because international politics requires there to be a trust, a, a system of trust to say that the Australian certification of that hydrogen is correct. Mm -hmm. right. Now, that Japanese buyer of green hydrogen, they can buy Australian with an Australian certificate or they can buy Korean with a Korean certificate. Are they equal? Do we have the same confidence? Do we, you know, compared to another, you know, Vietnam have made green hydrogen or, or, or someone else's, America's so, made green so hydrogen. In telecom, we have the International Telecommunications Union, right? They, they try and set these sorts of standards for 5G or whatever else, yep. right? You can tell I've been playing with this stuff for a little while. Mm -hmm. What's the equivalent in the energy sector? It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. So right. you ask what the challenges are? There's a challenge for right. an export market. So, sounds like a new institution new lawyers can build. Well, it shouldn't be built by the lawyers, to be I honest. I agree, by the but, way. Uh, but the problem <laughs> is it gets bogged down in international relations. Yes. Right? Yeah. Um, but that's a challenge. Okay. So what you're going to have, and the way that the world is setting up itself, is bilaterals. Right? So these agreements between Germany and Australia, and between Australia and Japan, and Australia and Korea, <laughs> The premise of those, or the value that will come out of those, is the certification. So that's really interesting, right? So you're saying groupings, like the quad, for example, right? Or, or you asked me to predict things. I'm yeah, predicting no, no, that's good. Goes, we're, right? this, this Greenfield stuff here, right? Yep. No one's done this before, really. No. They have. Well, we're trying to relate it to the emergence of the renewable sector. Yeah. But this is somehow bigger in a way because it has mm -hmm. this export capacity element to it. Right, which I never really bought before until with, with wind and solar like I am buying with this, right? We can't, um, yeah. Yeah, well, there was a whole, anyway, we, we, there was a whole idea that if we got the technology right mm. on wind and solar, we could then wind and solarify, if that's a word, everyone else. That was, and that, that has happened to some extent, right? Lots of businesses going out and advising other countries. But this is different. This is actually the export of the energy itself. Well, that's exactly right. right. That's so the difference here. That's the LNG thing, right? Yeah, well, hydrogen gives you the ability this is, you know, this is what gets me really excited about hydrogen. I was going to sort of end our discussion on this point, but let me throw it in there right now. Hydrogen, green hydrogen, allows Australia to export its sun and its wind. We Correct. can export the weather. I was talking to someone from Britain earlier today who said that every time there was sun, people stop working and go out and enjoy the sun. We don't have that problem. Well, the, but, the, but the English... Apart are, from today, it seems Well, the, so. in, the English yeah. are going really hard into green hydrogen they through are. offshore wind. Yes. Now, lots of wind. they've got plenty of wind. Got plenty right. of wind, so they're taking advantage of that. Um, how England, the UK, can win in green hydrogen and we lose is beyond me. Really, it's yeah. beyond well, me. We have better assets. We have much better natural yeah. resources. We are blessed with our wind and our solar hot resources. Um, we should win this. We can export the sun and the wind in the form, form of green hydrogen, and Australia can win that whole, the, 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 the world is up for grabs, and we should win. Uh, we have got all the reasons to win, and in some respects, we just need the politicians to sort of do a little few things and then get out of the way. Right, so we got off that, so certification. Mm -hmm. What else? <sighs> Demand, so the origin, so what will happen first? Creation of demand. Creation right? of demand in Australia, so domestic yeah. demand. Yeah. So if government wants to do something today, you can say, I'm going to go and buy hydrogen buses, hydrogen garbage trucks, um, my, my government fleet, not necessarily the, sort of the small car fleet for, you know, yeah. Commonwealth so car you've stuff. you've just touched local government, you've touched state government. And to pot yeah. potentially the feds, right? But vehicles that are doing, you sort of says, okay, vehicles that do over 150,000 kilometres a year. Yeah. Should be using. Should be hydrogen. Yeah. If the government did that today, it would create sufficient demand, or well, a, a lot more demand for green hydrogen. Well, that's a form of renewable energy target, effectively. They Correct. Just, yeah, because that's, that's what the renewable energy target is. It's a demand target. Exactly. So... But it, it's also a subsidy because those vehicles yeah, are more expensive than buying a petrol one, which is a different discussion, right? But um, so the government is spending more than it could otherwise. But it does that on a policy decision to create demand. Mm. And, the, and the externality of it is it got a vehicle, which is going to need anyway. It's, it's a market starting investment, right? Correct. That's sort of the argument here, right? Correct. And it's not the first time we've subsidised industries. We can, we can only go into the car industry, for example, 
which at one point was, uh, I can't remember the number, 2,000 cars per year or something. Yeah, an enormous um, amount. And for but, a substantial subsidy. The, the single largest subsidy provided by the federal government in Australia today is a diesel subsidy. Yeah, correct, for farm equipment and industry and whatever else. Which we, so yeah. the he most heavily subsidised industry in Australia, coming taking your tax dollars and mine, is into fossil fuels, is into diesel. Mm. Which clearly is going to change by the sounds of things. Well, just equally subsidise it. So, so don't, stop, don't stop the diesel subsidy, but give an equal subsidy to hydrogen. Mm. And then, then, then you'll see an equal, that's, that's an equal playing field. That's an equal playing field. So certification, regulation, and e equalization, I suppose, is what you'd call it, between <laughs> fossil fuel and energy uh, and hydrogen, just like we saw effectively for wind and solar. Yep. Uh, what I'm trying to do is show that we've done this before. Yeah, absolutely. This is not a new thing. This is right? not a new thing. We, we know absolutely. how to do this. And in order for Australia to be successful, we've now got the political, I guess the political sponsorship is there. What I think is really interesting is it's a political sponsorship that is global mm. and competitive. So the Europeans have now put half a trillion euro, apparently, in the next 10 years into hydrogen infrastructure development, right? I, you know, given most of the countries have no money at all, where it comes from, another question. But, you know, they're, they're doing it. Germany right? have put billions of yeah. euros into it. Well, billions, right? So half a trillion in 10 years, that's a big, that's a big amount of money. Then you've got all the, as we talked about earlier, the sovereign wealth funds, the super annual, there's plenty of money, right? Mm. It's just a question of like creating that demand and as you quite correctly say, confirming that it's green and not some yeah, other so you've got rainbow colour. Absolutely. Right? So th that transition, so what does the Australian government do? It creates domestic demand. For, for, for green hydrogen, by, and then it creates a certifica certification system to do that. Then you start to get hydrogen to go from $8 a kilo to six yeah. to three, and then you're at magic two. And then, or you're at least within touching distance of two. And then you can go and sign contracts with Japan, Korea, and everybody else at $2 and make it. Yeah, and then it'll fall even further as the demand goes further, right? So, look, I mean, it's, it's an exciting future. Look, you won't believe this, but we'll have to end soon. Ah. Um, and it's been an absolutely fascinating and robust discussion, as always. Mm. Um, but I usually like to end these things by asking my guests for three things that they would like to see for Australia to really achieve, right? So I, I tend to spend my podcast talking about what we can do as a country, mm. how we can actually punch above our weight as a country, because I love this country and I'm mm. passionate about it. I know you are. You're big on this. Mm. We've talked about some of the things, but if you were to sum it up in three brief things, what would they be? Um, I think the opportunity for Australia to dominate the world in hydrogen, in green hydrogen, is there, and we need government to support that the same way that it's supported, you know, successfully supported solar and wind with the renewable energy targets. I think one is that, and we've talked about all the ways that government can, can do that. I think that government can also support the R&D piece, and the R&D piece is a, the Australian support of R&D and new technologies um, is not great. No, in fact, um, we didn't even touch on that, did we? Yeah, we yeah. didn't, so, uh, but... It's a big deal. But people who are looking to raise funds find it very difficult to raise funds in Australia because it's inherently conservative and they go to America. Yeah, okay. that's true. And, um, and many technology sectors, are done a and whole nother podcast on that too. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's avoid that for hydrogen, green hydrogen. That would be my suggestion because the, we do have the smart people here to do it. Let's stop exporting our ideas um, and start exporting commodities. So I think the, that would be first, that would be the second. And then I think the opportunity for transition. So we need to, we, we need to really... Yeah, the, the, the phrase is a just and fair transition. So we've got large coal communities that are built around fossil fuels. Yes. Okay? We, we need to not leave them behind. This it is, is such very, an important point. Very important. So we need policies around that. And all of those people, all of those people in those communities, they want a future. Right? And holding on to the past is not a future. We need to help them transition. And that, to me, is... Yeah, we see that in renewable energy zones and other things, other government, government policies, but they can be part of the energy transition. They should be actually in the middle of it. Mm. So what do we need? What, 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 what should we do? We should help those communities transition. And that's not just putting everyone into a TAFE course. It is 
supporting local industry to build electrolyzers, supporting local demand for green hydrogen to create a domestic market which will lead to an export market. Take a longer view. Just because we're buying green hydrogen today for $8 a kilo doesn't mean that in three or five or 10 years time it won't be $2, because it will be $2, right? It's not gonna be $8 forever. So to me, take a view around that transition get everyone on board behind, you know, every community behind it. Um, and that will, the politics then looks after itself. Articulate as always. Matt Bourne-Gatell, thank you so much for being part of Smarter Cities. Thanks for listening to this episode of Smarter Cities. Please do subscribe to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher or LinkedIn. Leave us a rating, it always helps. And tell your friends about us on social media. Intro and outro music is by Bruno E at Public Memory. We are produced by Social Titanium out of New York. Check him out at socialtitanium.co.